For today, we're at our last stop, the atmosphere. And I'm going to talk about a, uh, a method that enables us to forecast the climate. As we know, atmosphere is one of the subsystems of the Earth where we can feel the impacts of climate change in real time. And to make plans for our future in terms of agriculture, planning cities, and in many other aspects, we need to be able to forecast or have an idea about the future of our climate. To do so, there are various methods out there, but uh, a lot of them use this process of statistical downscaling. What this entails is taking large-scale climate uh, models, they are all abbreviated as GCMs, that st stands for the Global Climate Model, and they try to calibrate these models using fine-scale observed uh, clim climate data. To give you an idea about the scale mismatch in this problem, first I'm going to show you cell locations where the global climate models are run. These are global models, and I'm just showing this model to you over the United States. You can see that this is a fairly coarse model. In this model, variables such as wind speed, wind vorticity, humidity are simulated, and these large-scale vari variables are used to predict temperature. So where does the temperature data come from? They come from stations where there are actual measurements of temperature. This is a subset of temperature stations in the United States. As you would appreciate, these stations collect temperature data at a location that is very sensitive to local features, such as distance to a water body, distance to a mountain, distance to a city. Um, but this fine-scale information is not, doesn't exist in the global climate model, which which models larger scale parameters. In order to resolve the scale difference, we will go through the process of downscaling, where we will calibrate this, where we calibrate this large scale variable. Before going into my analysis, I need to do some data preparation. We know that measurements do have missing values in them. Sometimes these stations are down for repair. Some are uh, powered by solar power, and uh, because of intermittency, the station might be down. So we can have stations where we have unobserved values at a given time. That doesn't mean that the station has been down all the time. It just means that at a given time, in this case, uh, March of 2012, it wasn't able to collect any data. We can toss out all the locations that have missing data, but we can be uh, reducing our data set quite a bit if we do that. To avoid that, I'm going to do some data preparation before my analysis. I'm going to use one of the new tools we have, Fill Missing Values, where at station locations where I have missing data, I'm going to fill the missing values using my six nearest neighbors, and I'm going to use their average to fill in missing values for temperature measurements at these stations. So I'll be geo-enriching my data this way so that I have a larger set to work with. After I go through this process, now I have my same data set, but now I have filled in temperature values at locations that were missing data, that were estimated using my neighbors. And another step I need to take to gap the scale difference between the global climate model outputs and temperature observed at these temperature stations, I need to create a smooth interpolation surface. And I'm going to be using the same tool that Margin has used in our demo, the empirical Bayesian creaking. So the second part of my data preparation will entail taking large-scale global climate model outputs and creating smooth interpolation surfaces. Since I'm going to be working on United States to predict the temperature over United States, I'm going to be limiting my study spatially to uh, to mainland United States. When I, form, when I perform EBK, I can get continuous surfaces of um, different output parameters from the global climate model. Here I'm going to show you two, but there are actually 19 output parameters that we're going to link to local temperature. So the examples I'm going to show here is the surface airflow. You can see that this is a very smoothly varying parameter because this is a large scale model, and pressure at sea level. So now I can extract the values for the global climate model at every station data, meaning that I'm ready to do my analysis.
I would like to form a relationship between these large-scale variables and the temperature data. And I'm going to do this today by using regression. And I'm going to be making use of a library called scikit-learn, which is a machine learning library of Python, to do that. I'm going to be using various predictors and see if they can work for my problem. The first one I'm going to use is a support vector machine. The reason behind that is all of my input parameters are highly related to each other. And I can wrap functionality in scikit-learn library from Python within Python toolboxes and use these functions as if they are native ArcGIS Pro functions. So to briefly go through all 19 of these input parameters, and I promise I'm not going to talk about each and every one of them, I have east-west winds observed at different pressure regimes. I have vorticity, which is a um, which is a measure of rotation of the wind, specific humidity, uh, pressures that are simulated, humidity, um, and also geopotential height and airflow at different uh, pressure levels. You will expect that when I have the same variable appearing, just observed, just simulated at different pressure levels, they are going, there is going to be collinearity. They are going to be related to one another. So the reason behind picking support vector machine is fitting a nonlinear regression to this highly coupled system. And in my Python code, which I'm not going to show you here, I have built in some visualizations to give me an idea about how good my fit is. So I'm going to be looking at all of these plots. They'll be popping up uh, when I start running my function. So this is the first plot that I use to just look at my fit. The red line indicates the temperatures observed at the stations. And the dark line that is barely visible is the model fit, which means that I have an almost exact fit. So when you look at this on 1D, this looks very satisfactory. This looks like a perfect fit. But we know that predicting temperature is a spatial problem. So I'm going to map this, and this is another advantage of using Python toolboxes, similar to our ArcGIS bridge, you can move your data back and forth into ArcGIS to inspect it visually. So now, let's take a look at the support vector machine result. And remember that when we look at it 1D, it was a very good fit. Now, this is the temperature profile that we simulate over US. What happened here is we had a very good fit at station locations, but we couldn't generalize this model because just by looking at this map, this is not what we would expect temperature profile to be. So when we look at the histogram, if you're looking at two cities, one of them is here. And when you go 100 miles, this map basically tells me that one city is having peak summer temperatures, and the other one is deep in winter, which, is, which doesn't make any sense. So this model overfit to data and couldn't generalize. I'm going to use another method from the scikit-learn library called ridge regression, which can overcome this by, uh, by regularizing the, the fit we have. Again, I'm going to be using the same predictors, as I mentioned, and I'm going to be predicting monthly average temperature like before. And this time, I'm not going to give this model tweaking parameters. I'm going to learn it from my data, and I'm going to show you a diagnostic plot. And this is this alpha parameter. That basically is a penalty function that says, you might have a good fit, but if you're using complex functions, I'm going to penalize that. So this enables us to have an OK fit by using simple curves rather than overfitting to data with complex functions like polynomials. And it infers the correct alpha level, and it completes the analysis. And here is my ridge regression result. Although I just did a global regression, this looks like a very logical temperature profile. It is gradually changing. I'm seeing certain patterns of change in this, in this temperature change, and this looks very plausible. So these were the two functions that I uh, borrowed from Sci Python scikit-learn library. And I was easily able to do this because of uh, creating Python toolboxes that enables me to consume these functions like native ArcGIS Pro functions. Now, in the last method I'm going to try, I'm going to include a dimension that we really like here at Esri, the space. For that, I'm going to be using geographically weighted regression. 
In simple words, what GWR or geographically weighted regression does is it fits multiple regression models that change over space, meaning that a variable can be very impactful in predicting the predictant at a certain location, but, but its impact might change over space. And it accounts for that. One requirement it has is it requires independent variables. So I have picked three, of, three independent variables among a big list of 19 variables I had. So if you compare this to previous methods, it's going to be doing inference with way less parameters, three instead of 19, to predict monthly average temperature. In the interest of time, I'm going to show you the GWR result. And this is the result we get. Again, a very plausible um, pattern of temperature predicted using the global climate model. What is very interesting is just by accounting for space inherently in this algorithm, we can have a prediction, a plausible prediction, using only three input parameters instead of 19. And that shows the power of including space in our analysis. With that being said, we have gone through the exercise of uh, having predictors and building a statistical model from data coming from different scales and, um, and predicting the local average temperature by using three different methods. And with that, um, I would like to now give the floor back to Drew, back to Drew. for a wrap up.